Well, the Inquisition. Its very name immediately brings to mind one of the darkest eras of the Catholic Church in Western Europe, where those who are perceived as heretics were hunted out, placed on trial, tortured, imprisoned, and often put to death, typically by being burnt at the stake, but uh, uh, through other cruel methods as well. Beginning in 1184, the uh, and continuing with the in the fury uh, into the 12, 13, 14, 1500s in Spain and Portugal, the Inquisition attempted to end uh, theological innovation uh, to to stop believed attacks by the devil, and especially silence what was often called free thinking via their well-organized methodology of intimidation and terror. But the modern world was rising. And as much as this institution attempted to end divisions in the church and, and end open expression, with every one group suppressed, another arose. Until the number of those who joined, for example, the Protestant Reformation, overwhelmed its ability to keep up and eventually diminished its power. In this lecture, we will not only hear stories from the perspective of the inquisitors, but also the beliefs of those they tried to silence, and in some cases, uh, silenced successfully. We will learn about the beliefs of the mysterious dualistic Cathars. We'll be learning about the Waldensians. We'll be learning about the spiritual Franciscans, uh, the Knights Templar, and the Beguines, which, by the way, is part of an all-female uh, mystical movement. We will learn about those who are deemed as witches and the persecution of the Jews in Spain. We're going to go over all of this. It's quite a bit. What I decided to do is going through and putting together this talk, I mean, after a while, if you read about the Inquisition, it's very methodical. But after a while, I'm not going to say it's dull, because it's not dull. But after a while, you know, it kind of grinds you down. So I want to make sure that I peppered it up. And it's important to know what the Inquisition was trying to suppress. I think that's an even more interesting idea. Right. I want to I want to I want to go there with that. So so follow me if you will. And while trials against those perceived as heretics had already been part of the policy of the the Catholic Church uh, uh, by the Middle Ages, what we officially know as the Inquisition, as an institution, began in, in France in the 12th century. Before this time, uh, individuals or groups. Uh, expressing ideas counter to the doctrines of the Catholic Church, were brought to trial. Uh, they were charged as, as heretics and received various punishments from required penances to, uh, to be followed, to excommunication, to imprisonment, sometimes for years. However, it's a big however. With that said, these trials involved no torture, and the verdict was hardly ever death. Okay, so I don't want you to get in your minds that, that it's, you know, these kinds of policies are going back further. It is going on sporadically, but not nothing is systematic. With this said, some countries would then move these charged heretics into a civil court. And here, torture and death was sometimes the result. And again, with that said, these actions and verdicts did not officially involve the church in this case. But when, when is the Inquisition? as we know it as a structure begin. It began in 1184 in Languedoc, uh, France, uh, against those known as the Cathars. It wasn't as systematic at first. Uh, it was, it was in fact, they called this the Episcopal uh, Inquisition. Uh, and so what happens is it was administered by the local bishops, of the southern part of France to deal with the Cathars. 
However, uh, the next phase of the Inquisition started around 1208. Now, and, and, and the reason why is because of a believed heretical sect known as the Albigensians, also known as the Cathars. And they were becoming popular, <laughs> you want to use such a word, uh, in France and Italy, and the church became very concerned. They received various warnings to reform, but instead of changing their ways, as the church wanted, they began to openly defy uh, papal authority, specifically uh, the authority of Pope Innocent III. Uh, so let's go to the first picture. Let's take a look at old Pope Innocent III. Let's see here. Uh, Pope Innocent III there. Is there he is, yeah. Uh, this is how uh, he, uh, he, he was Pope from 1198 to 1216. And so what's going to happen uh, is the Pope will then send Dominican monks to try to convince the Cathars to change their ways. When that didn't work, Innocent III attempted to get uh, Raymond uh, VI, Count of Toulouse, to contain the insubordinate Cathars. Events did not go uh, as planned, however, with the result that the representative of the Pope, a certain Pierre, was mysteriously murdered in 1208. And to make matters worse, the Count suddenly found himself as the main suspect. So to deflect this embarrassment, the papacy and Innocent III uh, zealously launched the Cathar Crusade the very next year in 1209 with 30,000 laying waste to the entire Languedoc region in the south of France. To help entice the soldiers to fight with all their strength, the Pope offered indulgences to all its participants, just like any other Christian crusade. Desperate, the Cathars fled to those sympathetic to their plight, uh, for instance, to the people like Ramon Roger Travaux, who gave them sanctuary within Carcassonne's majestic city fortress. But ultimately, one by one, those harboring the Cathars found themselves defeated by Samon de Montefort's forces. Uh, let's go to the next picture. Okay, this is Bezias. Uh, this is, of course, uh, what happens in the year 1204. French soldiers of Simon, Simon de Montfort uh, swept into the fortified town of Beziers. And what they did, go to the next picture, is there was a massacre of 20,000, 20,000, 20,000 citizens right on the spot. <laughs> this is not to say that the soldiers did not torture their victims first including blinding and, and mutilation, followed by dragging them uh, behind horses and using them for target practice. In desperation, some fled to a nearby church, hoping to find sanctuary there. Unfortunately, they were dead wrong. Within moments, the building was torched and engulfed in flame. Outside, the soldiers just stood there in full repose confident in their righteousness as men and women and children shrieked before the fiery fate within. There was, there was absolutely no pity. There was no remorse. And what was the unpardonable crime of those at Bazias? In the attacker's estimation, they were either heretics called Cathars, or they were fellow Catholics foolish enough to harbor them. It said that the papal legate's troops were ordered not to particularly discriminate between Catholics and Cathars in the town, encouraged instead to, quote, kill them all. God will recognize his own, unquote. I'll go to the next picture. So there is a dedication. Uh, there to uh, the slaughter of these these innocents. Uh, this is it right here. I'll go to the next one. Okay, so we'll put that down. That's for for later on. Okay, so thank you, Margie. So um, so what happens is is that yet what according to Pierre, 
the Vas de Sane, a Cistercian monk writing at the time, the leaders and often uh, the instigator of this brutality, uh, Simon de Montfort, typically followed his lengthy prayers by laying his sword upon the altar and crying out. This is the one who's connected to slaughtering all these people. All these people, right? Wow, you know, what, is he, what does he do? He prays. He says, this is his prayer. What I, a prayer, in my perspective, is absolutely a murderer, a killer, not a soldier, cowardice. Here it is. Here's his prayer. Oh, good Lord, he says. Oh, gentle Jesus. What? He starts his prayer that way? It's unbelievable. I'll continue. You have chosen me to wage your wars in spite of my unworthiness. Since when do you, the God of the New Testament, want us to wage these wars? It is from your altar that I receive my arms today, so that in the moment of fighting your battles, I may receive my weapons from you, unquote. Because Simon was so, com so completely believed he was right before God, and that the Cathars were an heir, he felt fully justified to murder them all in mass. So who were these Cathars so seemingly deserving uh, uh, this deemed holy crusade and becomes the trigger, the trigger for the Inquisition. This We're, we're looking into the causes for the Inquisition, the need for something to be more, uh, it's, that's created, an institution that's created to deal with the situation. Well, we got to look into the Cathars, look into the problem, and then we'll look into what is considered the Catholic solution to this. Got it? So we got to understand this. So <clears throat> Who are the Cathars? Uh, the Cathars, um, the name originated from the word Catharus, meaning pure, and was applied to many, by the way, Christian sects, including the Novationists, uh, mentioned by Epiphanius, uh, and also uh, uh, <laughs> mentioned by a certain Manichaean by the name of Augustine. The first group of so-called Cathars uh, in Western Europe appears at Orléans in, in France in 1022. But there's not enough evidence to link them securely uh, to, to other groups called the Paternas or Paternas. There is, exists, however, some evidence that suggests, well, actually to show or demonstrate that there is a link with the Bogomils. But let's go there. Let's go back. So what are the possible origins of the Cathars? Why this question has often been asked. The answer is long and drawn out and often means leading. With this in mind, I will briefly outline the gradual movement of a certain dualistic religious perspectives and how they evolved and gradually moved westward. The first dualistic religious system uh, that will begin this spiritual odyssey is Zoroastrianism, more pro properly called Mazdaism because of its particular veneration of Uhura Mazda, the god of light. Uh, and of course, the founder is Zoroaster whose uh, origins are shrouded in mystery. The basic tenets of Mazdaism uh, is that there's a great cosmic battle between the forces of light and the forces <coughs> of darkness, uh, between uh, uh, Ahura Mazda, this great fire deity of purity and goodness, righteousness, and Ataman, or Atamanu, uh, who is the spirit of darkness. And so this world is between these two powers going back and forth. Uh, eventually, uh, Zoroastrianism will become the official uh, belief system of the, of the Persian Empire. Uh, and uh, we'll feed into other ideas. Of course, uh, this is not talking Zoroastrianism, but it's fascinating because you have <laughs> uh, you have this idea of the soul, right, uh, uh, splits. When you're when you're born and you have this over soul and you have yourself and you live your life and you're judged by what you do, good or bad. And then when you die, your over soul joins with your regular soul and tattles on you. It says if you've been naughty or nice and if you've been. And so 
as your tattling takes place, you cross what's called the Chinvap Bridge. And as you cross the Chinvap Bridge, if you have been good, then you the, the bridge is strong and it's wide and you cross right over and you go to the House of Song, which is like paradise. But if you've been bad, uh, the bridge twists and turns and throws you into uh, the House of Pain where there's with fire and brimstone, and the food is not very good, according to the Avestas. I don't know, the guy's a chef, but uh, it's like, well, you're burning up and everything else. And like, wow, the, the food just not enough salt. Anyway, so then what happens is that uh, after a period of time, there arises up, born of a virgin, Sarosant, and Sarosant uh, is uh, he is does miracles and all these kind of wonderful things, and there's a general resurrection of the dead. Yes, this is Zoroastrianism, Zoroastrianism, and so the righteous move from the house of song and join the the angelic yazatas, join the the angel like beings, and of course the evil ones. Uh, uh, they are released and they join uh, the demons, and there's this great battle. There's a great apocalypse between the two going on there. Uh, the moon turns to blood. It's really terrible. And in the end, uh, the good guys win, and everybody's brought before the great judgment throne of Uhura Mazda, and there's a lake of fire behind them, and everybody's pushed into the lake of fire. But if you've been good, if you're righteous, you won't burn. Uh, so yay. And if you're bad, you burn. There's other versions of it, but this is kind of you can see there's a lot of ideas that come from Zoroastrianism. You have, of course, the devil concept, uh, the messianic concept that goes in during the Babylonian captivity of Judaism. You got, uh, oh, uh, you know, apocalyptic Judaism, you know? Anyway, so this belief system shoom, goes into some, a belief system called Manichaeism. Manichaeism, and of course, it's founded by Manny uh, in around, uh, you know, around... Uh, the 200s. Uh, he dies between 274 to 277 uh, for heresy. So Mazdaism is now similar uh, to um, it is similar to uh, the Zoroastrian in many ways. And so while Mazdaism or Zoroastrianism stressed the battling dualism between light and darkness, uh, what will happen is Manichaeism, uh, I'm going to say this, ultimately Nature is still will win over the win the day. It's good ultimately in Zoroastrianism. It's ultimately uh, this battle will be worth it. But with Manichaeism, ultimately uh, this world is evil. Ultimately, it's evil and just it just needs to be destroyed. So it's a little different emphasis. So Mazdaism has some of the same idea of the dualism. You got the Father Light that commands the good. Uh, through his divine emanations, and he sends the mother of life, the messenger. Uh, and in some systems, he sends Jesus, the luminous who suffered, and whose uh, disciple, Mani, offers the words of salvation. Meanwhile, the father of darkness fought against the light, where his demons were always attacking and tempting the good and pure. Uh, for Manichaeans, time was divided into three periods. First, an age when the spirit of light was not yet mixed with the matter of evil. Uh, second, the present age, when the spirit and matter are mixed, causing tensions and constant conflict. And third, the future, when the good realm and the dark realm will be separated once again, and the good going to the realm of the north, the evil going to the realm of the south. Who is a big proponent of this? Yes, and his name is Augustine. Augustine was a follower of Manichaeism before he converted over to Christianity, which is very much Latin West Catholic Christianity. And even though he denies this duality, you know, uh, the coming from Manichaeism, which in turn came from Zoroastrianism, because one was an offshoot from the other, uh, what happens is that he does unfortunately put that dualism into theology. City of God, city of man. <laughs> and also, unfortunately, empowers the darker side. A lot, there's a lot of focus more on evil, where early Christians didn't focus so much on the devil. They, they focus more on God and light. Uh, now you're going to have this new division. Okay. By the way, one other thing about uh, uh, that, that pertains to this talk, uh, what happens also, Manichaeism, the adherents of Manichaeism were separated into two grades, those who are the elect and those who are the hearers. Uh, and uh, Augustine obviously was just a hearer. Okay, so then from this group, oh no, arise 
the Paulicians who appeared in Asia Minor. So uh, let's go ahead and start looking at the screen there. We'll take a look at some pictures here, pretty pictures. And so we'll see kind of the things here. So, yeah, so this right here is an image connected to, of course, Zoroastrianism. So we got Ahura Mazda. Go to the next image. Great. So uh, the next image uh, is a little bit of Manichaeism. So we have this emblem of Manichaeism. I think that's kind of cool. And then go to the next one. And these are really small. This, these are the Paulicians. They're connected now. They're kind of grow from uh, the uh, the Manichaeism. Uh, they they appear in Asia Minor in Byzantine sources, and uh, which testify that the Paulicians were dualistic and direct descendants of the Manichaeans. Some of the most prominent Byzantine scholars advocated this direct connection were uh, Rutzemann and Lemery. They also believe that the incarnation of Christ is merely illusionary a perspective often called docetism, asserting that Jesus only appeared to be material, but was in reality spirit. This belief would be later shared by both the later Bogomils and the Cathars. But unlike the more peaceful Manichaeism, uh, the Paulicians were a little bit more militaristic. Go to the next picture. So yeah, a little bit more militaristic. <laughs> you get the point there, right? And so they formed their own independent state, surviving from 843 to 879, and openly raided the Byzantine Empire, often attacking the coastal cities of Asia Minor, including Ephesus in 869. Eventually, many of the Paulicians reached the Balkans and influenced another group emerging of dualists called the Bogomils. Go to the next picture. Ah, so we have remnants of the Bogomils in the Balkan regions. We're going to see a few of these pictures. The Bogomils believed that there existed two realms, an evil material one run by the devil and the spiritual one run by God. While they did accept much orthodox theology, they practiced a very strict asceticism with those considered of the elect, even practicing complete sexual abstinence, as well as refraining from both wine and meat, much like we saw with the Manichaeans. The Bogomils were already stirring up waves in Constantinople by the 11th century. Persecution soon followed, uh, helping to spread the movement in the direction of Western Europe. A group of Bogomils fought to hold their position in the Balkans and survived in Bosnia and Serbia and Dalmatia for quite some time. Uh, so take a look at the next pictures. So this is some of the remnants they have. Uh, look, that's kind of really neat. And you can see... Uh, this is, of course, the dualistic cross that will be uh, later on adopted uh, by the Cathars. Go to the next image. Now, this is really small, but it's a really good image. I mean, it's a good picture there. Go to the next one. So, yes. So, this is a characteristic. This is, again, this is the uh, cross of the Bogomils that will now become part of the cross of the Cathars. That we see that there before. Eventually, they move on to the Italian peninsula around the early 12th century uh, because of the Ottoman Turks. By this time, these dualists had become known as Paterains rather than Bogomils. According to primary sources from the time, dualistic missionaries arrived from the Balkans to teach a more absolute form of dualism in the south of France around the latter half of the 12th century. Another group of Bogomils went northward to Germany, eventually filtered down into France, coming from the other way perhaps merging with their fellow dualists in the south of France, where they all became known as the Cathars or Albigensians. Go to the next image. Okay, that's that's good. Go to the next one. It's kind of small. I wish it were bigger. Oh, yeah. There's, there's another. That's a wonderful image from the Balkans. Kind of cool looking uh, tombstones there, right? You see all the, the images there. Go to the next one. Love the iconography. All right, so affirming a dualistic theology, the Cathars believed two equally powerful gods ruled the world. Uh, they believed the spiritual good God, uh, who viewed as the God of love and the deity dwelling within, and they also they believe in the deity uh, dwelling within the material realm, who is fundamentally evil in essence, and that was called the Rex Mundi, or the king of the world. Yet they did not advocate a pure dualism. And that the Cathars envisioned a final winner in this contest. 
with the God of spirit eventually triumphing over the material devil in the end? Since ma the material realm and matter itself was evil, the Cathars either flat out denied Jesus could in any way participate with the material world and still be called the son of God, and hence he was pure spirit, and so advocating what's called docetism, or they held he was no different from any other man who has ever lived. Uh, and so, in short, uh, Jesus either died as a flesh and blood human on the cross, or he was a spirit in possession of a phantom body that could never suffer the indignity of crucifixion. As for the Old and New Testaments, which they did indeed use, they were, they were seen as allegories. Uh, meant to teach a moral doctrine of purity. Go to the next image. That's a, that's, a, that's a great image. Because of their disdain for the material world, the Cathars were quite offended by the growing opulence enjoyed by the church, viewing their local Catholic clergy as complacent tools of the dark one, of the dark lord. But they went further than just rejecting material wealth, for they also perceived that the physical body was indeed, quote, a filthy envelope of the flesh, unquote, purifying it by practicing a rigid asceticism and abstaining from anything related to matter or the creation of it, hence, of course, sex. And while not sex was not outright condemned, it was discouraged, especially for those who sought to attain the highest perfection. Let's go to the next one. There's another great image of the cross. Let's go to the next one. It's good. Yes, beyond sexual abstinence, the Cathars rejected all forms of milk products, eggs, and every type of meat, except for fish in some cases. With this said, not all the Cathars could follow these strict rules, so two classes came out. Those who had been perfected, receiving uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit by the imposition of hands, the final seal that committed them to follow their complete abstinence before the God of Spirit. Uh, known as the consolatium, and the common believers who promised to receive the baptism of the Spirit before they died. While they rejected the sacraments of the Catholic Church, as well as the doctrine of hell and purgatory, by the 1140s, the Cathars had organized into their own distinct church with a unique liturgy, hierarchy, and doctrines. Go to the next one. Uh, there, there he goes. There, there's the persecution there. Go to the next one. That's a good one, too. Go to the next one. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Go to the next one. So, okay. So what happens now is one of the principal chronicles uh, from the early 13th century was a Cistercian Pierre de Val de Cernay recording uh who recorded the massacre of Biziers and writing amongst other things a work called the description of the Cathars and Waldensians. He reports of the Cathars simple dress, accuses them of usury, and testifies to their very strict doctrine regarding Mary Magdalene. To begin with, O Pierre Sonnet notes the attack on Biziers uh, occurred according to plan, on July 22nd, which was the feast day of Mary Magdalene, adding how it was a supreme justice of providence, that's his words, in regard to the fact that the Cathars believed, quote, Mary Magdalene was a concubine of Jesus Christ, unquote. Quote. Incensed by this belief, he continues that, quote, it was therefore with just cause that those disgusting dogs were taken out and massacred during the feast of the one that they had insulted. All right, I'll go to the next one. Uh, in his description of the Cathars and Waldensians, uh, Cernay also asserts that the heretics affirmed the marriage uh, of Jesus to Mary Magdalene. In other accounts, including a text uh, called The Exposure of the Albigensian Heresies, often connected with Aragard uh, Bizia, uh, the claim is made once again that the, quote, Cathars taught in their secret meetings that Mary Magdalene was the wife of Jesus Christ, unquote. So you can see people are getting pretty angry within the Catholic Church and the clergy. Here they are. Uh, so they are 
in many cases claiming that that you know Jesus uh, is is either fully human or he is fully a spirit, um, which of course is fine. But I'm saying this is upsetting for many Catholics of that day. Uh, they are a, a, they're, they're not following the Eucharist. They are not following any of, of, of canon law. Uh, they have formed their own church. Uh, they teach this very strong sense of dualism. Uh, they are judging uh, Catholics uh, because of their hoarding of wealth. Uh, they practice a, a very strong sense of, of asceticism. And they view Mary Magdalene, in many cases, as the wife of Jesus. And so, so basically... Uh, even though I believe personally everybody has a right to believe whatever they want to believe, uh, for Europe at this time, this was considered such a drastic departure that many uh, within the Catholic Church panicked, especially uh, since this belief system really spread. And I got to tell you a little secret when you look at primary sources. These Cathars, according to people who knew them, they were really kind. <laughs> they were really nice. They're really hospitable. They were very loving. Uh, they took people in. They cared for people. And so very caring community. And as a result of that, people wanted to join. Hey, you know, they're taking better care of us. Uh, they seem to care about our families more than, than, the, than the church does. I think we're going to go to them. So this movement, you know, uh, spread a lot just by kindness and hospitality and empathy, even though they have a very high degree almost a puritanical sense of asceticism. They still were known to be very kindly. So by 1243, the majority of the Cathar fortresses had fallen. And so let's take a look at these fortresses. There are so many. This, they're at the, and it's so amazing how they're at the very top of the hill. Yes, I have actually been uh, to uh, some of these fortresses myself. And I even published an article on that. Go to the next picture. Look at these. It's amazing. You know, uh, but obviously they're trying to protect themselves. Uh, go to the next one. Oh, look at this. <laughs> That's pretty grand. You know, um, I love it. Go to the next one. These are sprinkled all over uh, the south of France. Wow. Yeah. Go to the next one. I've been to that one. Yeah. There's another complex. Uh, go to the next one. Oh, this is great. This is an image of Mary Magdalene. Uh, uh, look at, I mean, look at, you know, definitely shown with a, with a sense of authority. Yeah, go to the next one. All right. So what's going to happen now? While the majority of the Cathar fortresses had fallen, yet one still remained at Montsegur. Uh, which is perched 3,000 feet high upon a very uh, fordable mount uh, near the Pyrenees Mountains. Look at that. Look, I mean, <laughs> that's way up there. Unfortunately, their good fortune did not last long, and soon 10,000 French troops surrounded the fortification. In March of 1244, the castle finally surrendered, the Cathars burned in a massive bonfire. Go to the next picture. So they were able to get up this cliff. Go to the next picture. It's good. Yeah. So as various accounts testified just before the fortress capitulated to the Catholic forces, several Cathars reportedly slipped through Crusader front lines with a supposed treasure with them. Many believe because the Cathars were so fervently anti-material in their doctrines that this treasure must by necessity transcend mere material objects such as silver or gold, perhaps even having some kind of esoteric significance. Naturally, grail legends began to be associated with Montségur. Indeed, there are some linguistic similarities in the grail romance written by Wolfram von Eisenbach and his Percival. Uh, where he, this is written between 12 to 1210, where he calls his grail castle Montsauvat, similar to Montsegur, with both translated as meaning safe or secure mountain. Furthermore, the name of the historical uh, Montsegur 
Raymond uh, Pere does have a certain similarity uh, to the hero of Aschenbach's worth, uh, who's known as the Knight Percival. So you see similarities there. In another Grail epic by Albrecht uh, von Schwakenberg, uh, the first king of the Holy Grail also has a similar name to uh, Perseo, which is Perilla. The fact that the Cathars are so, so closely identified uh, to this area near Ran la Chateau with its mysterious associations mentioned in Holy Blood, Holy Grail only adds to the intrigue. Uh, you, can, you can take this down. Thank you so much, Margie, so you get the idea. Well, the Cathars are, are not, I would say not long gone, but they're uh, diminished. Uh, their mysterious remains will continue to perk the curiosity of, of so many enthusiastically seeking clues to some of Western Christianity's most intriguing legends for, for years to come. Of course, this evidence usually draws upon the well of either hostile Catholic sources or from meager evidence left by the Cathars themselves. As a result, the finds will always appear as sensational uh, as a respective author uh, needs uh, then to become as well, right? <laughs> but so now we got the problem. What's the solution? I don't think it's a problem, but the Catholics see this. You can, you can still understand it's pretty extensive. This is a belief system that is very different from the Catholicism of that time. So by 1229, Pope Gregory the Ninth. Uh, okay, we'll go back to we'll see. Look at a picture of Gregory, uh, Pope Gregory the Ninth. Uh, he was in charge from 1227 to 1241. There he is, very small picture. Uh, decided to officially establish uh, a. Oh, this that's actually Dominic. Uh, there, but okay, well, well, we'll get to him in a few seconds, so we'll stay there. Uh, officially established a permanent inquisition under the Domitians, who were based both in Rome and at Carcassonne. Now, the Domitians were founded by Dominic Felix de Guzman, who lived from 1170 to 1221. It's such a small picture, which we'll go ahead and put it down, but thank you so much. Uh, he was a Spanish priest uh, early on. Uh, and Dominic cared for the poor and suffering. So when a famine hit Spain in 1191, he was known to have sold his clothes to feed those who were hungry. But yet in 1203 or 1204, Alfonso VIII, uh, King of Castile, sent the Bishop of Osmo to Denmark. He sent this Bishop to Denmark in order to secure a bride for the crown prince, Ferdinand. And, of course, the bishop chose Dominic to accompany him. So they traveled directly through Provence. And here, Dominic first encountered the Cathars directly. What happened? Well, he was angry. He was upset because uh, they they didn't have correct doctrine. And so this fueled his desire to preach uh, to, uh, to the Catholics who are remaining correct theology. And he also wanted to try to convert the Cathars back to the Catholic faith. Yet while, while he let his views be known about the Cathars, Dominic still died in 1221, so was in no way connected to the Inquisition. But his followers certainly were when uh, Pope Gregory the Ninth created the permanent inquisition. So let's go to the next picture. I'm hoping Pope Gregory will pop up this time. <laughs> Be seen, Gregory. Let's see if he's there. Hey, we got Gregory. Yes, yeah, so Gregory. He created the permanent inquisition. So this is the guy that creates the permanent inquisition. Um, uh, now under their leadership under the leadership of the, of the Dominicans. So the Dominicans are the ones, this is the order that's in charge of the Inquisition, and they will be that all the way through to the 1500s. So when you hear about the Inquisition, it is the Dominicans. Now, obviously, there's other Catholic orders. You know, you got the Franciscans who are pretty loving and kind and so forth. We'll hear about a little bit about them a little bit later. Uh, you have the Cistercians, uh, those who are wearing the whites, very intellectual. You have, but but the, the but the, 
the, the Dominicans, they are a preaching order. They preach. And they, they're all about correcting, uh, correct doctrine. And they're also about fighting heresy. So, whew, so here we go. So this is Pope Gregory's fault. He's the one who did it. Their selection to become a charge of the Inquisition was natural since they were already uh, involved in attempting to convert the Cathars in southern France. And since they were already there and involved with them, the Pope figured, hey, they could be part of their trials too. But because they were involved in the torture of those who are implicated in the heresy, uh, the Dominicans were often disliked. Let's go to the next picture. The Dominicans were often disliked uh, even by loyal Catholics. Loyal Catholics sometimes called them Domine Canes. Domine Canis, what does that mean? In Latin, that means God's dogs. That's right, God's dogs. Wow. Yeah, so not, not that popular. Okay, so uh, thank you, Margie, so much. The papal bull, uh, known as the Ad Extirpanda, was issued following the murder on April 6, 1252, of the papal inquisitor of Lombardy. His name is St. Peter of Verona. Accordingly, those who wish to protect the Cathars uh, killed uh, this papal inquisitor. Uh, this bull, then issued by the Pope, declared uh, that the heretics, including the Cathars, were, quote, murderers of souls as well as robbers of God's sacraments and of the Christian faith, unquote. Because of their fallen condition, they were to, quote, to be coerced as are thieves and bandits into confessing their errors and accusing others, although one must stop short of danger to life or limb, which is interesting. As for torture, certain limits were defined. In general, torture could be used if, number one, it did not cause life, uh, loss of life or limb, you know, citra membri diminutitum et mortis peculium. Uh, it was it was also had to be used only once, and the inquisitor deemed the evidence against the accused to be virtually certain. So these are the reasons. So uh, the limits, again, I'll say this again, uh, is that uh, there's no loss of life or limb, right? Uh, it was to be used only once, and the inquisitor had to already beforehand deem the evidence against the accused to be virtually certain. Obviously, these restrictions are not going to be exactly followed. Uh, and so we're now going to go into exactly how the Inquisition worked. Here we go. In general, here we go. The procedure of the Inquisition went as follows. Messengers would arrive in town. And they would announce that the Inquisitors were soon to arrive and to be ready to greet them. For if they believed in the church and the theology taught by the church, they had nothing to fear. And so uh, they, you'd see in the distance them arriving. Sometimes uh, they would arrive in procession. Uh, there are even uh, 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 records of them uh, sometimes the music, they're singing as they're arriving, you know, or chanting, right? Upon arrival, they asked if anybody wished, possibly with a smile, to volunteer to talk with them. If they had any questions regarding their beliefs, if they understood their beliefs properly, it seemed like a nice appeal, doesn't it? Say, like, hey, guys, you know, you know. Do you believe, you know, do you have any problems? We're here to help out. We're here to clear up the ambiguities. You have nothing to be afraid of from us. We're just here to help. That's it. After that, they would find other volunteers uh, that were suspect in some of their beliefs. You know? <laughs> and in some cases, uh, informed upon uh to the inquisitors by name through somebody else in the community. 
you know, and say, I don't like this guy. I'm going to report him to the Inquisitor. And they find out, oh, really? If those who spoke to the Inquisitors were found to be an error in any way, but that this error was minor, the Inquisitors corrected them, asked them to swear their loyalty to the Catholic Church, and told to perform a small penance. Not too bad. Of course, the Catholic, sorry, of course, the Cathars were forbidden to swear oaths. You guys catch that, right? Again, they're told to swear their loyalty to the Catholic Church and told to perform a small penance. So immediately, if the person refused to swear the oath to the Catholic Church, they knew that was a Cathar, and they got him. And so at this point, the Inquisitor would know, and they would be immediately arrested. The Inquisitors also encouraged these volunteers to um, to explain why they had believed their repentant error in the first place? <laughs> was it on their own? Did they come up with this messed up theology on their own? Or did somebody else tell them to believe this way? And if the latter, who were they? And did they happen to be nearby? Now the person showed any kind of hesitation, not wishing to like betray your family or friend the inquisitor would then suddenly became a little, become a little more earnest telling them that their loyalty was was always to the catholic church and it's first and foremost above a family and friends you put god first put god first in your life you know put your wife and kids and family and everybody else put them all second right if they refused again, then the threats begin. They start to threaten. With the Inquisitor asserting that they it doesn't look like you're truly sorry for your um, for your error, and um, and uh, that uh, by protecting others who are part of this error, uh, you are defending the devil. Do you, do you really want to defend the devil? And the consequences, of course, for doing so would be quite severe. As you can imagine, uh, if they continued to resist, they were then arrested and tortured until they gave away the names. Of course, you had those who implicated everyone in the community, <laughs> uh, and they implicated them of all sorts of errors and heresies, some sort of very much just busy ratting everybody out. And if this happened, the Inquisitor, every single one of these individuals were investigated, even if they just kind of spelled out nine names. So if it turned out that the person who implicated everyone appeared to be incorrect in his, that person's assumption, they were not charged with anything for the false accusation. What? No, they're not charged with anything. They're just viewed to be simply zealous for the purity of the Catholic faith. And good job. This was forgivable. This was praiseworthy. Uh, for such vigilant uh, disposition could make for a, a heresy-free community. So keep up the good work. You know, go about it. Ooh. If those who were suspected of error or outright heresy did not volunteer themselves upon the Inquisitor's arrival into their community, knowing full well that they were present, and, and, and of course, and those of the Inquisition knew about them through others of the community. These individuals were then sought out and forcibly taken in, questioned, and if still resistant, they were arrested and imprisoned. Often they were not even told what they were charged for. As they were questioned until the sought after charge would come to the surface. So they did this whole thing of, okay, so you're guilty. What am I guilty for? What do you think you're guilty for? But well, I didn't do anything. Yeah, you did. We, everybody's talking about it. Was it for this? And the person messes up and they mention something else. They're all, oh, no, it wasn't that. But, uh, oh. So what about that? Wait, no, 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 no. Wait, wait, no, 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 no. Uh, was it for this? No, it wasn't for that either. But we're keeping a list here. Go back to that one, too. Yeah. All this kind of intimidation occurred. 
they often employ these trick questions, uh, intentionally trying to confuse those being questioned. Of course, the assumption was always that one was guilty until proven innocent, because uh, no longer do we have the Roman system of innocent until proven guilty. No, no, no. It's guilty until proven innocent, because after all, original sin, right? It's the idea that, uh, you know, uh, the first thing we'll go to is to the realm of error. So we must assume that the person is sinful first and then work the other way out. Now, the inquisitors had a two strike rule for a person was not supposed to put uh, uh, put death uh, for the first offense. Uh, they could be tortured uh, at length, even imprisoned for a while. But they, the first offense, they can't be killed. Yet if they committed a second offense, they were to be executed. Now, of course, the Inquisitor had to keep track of who had committed uh, the first offense. This is terrible how they do this. And so they came up with various strategies beyond simply writing down their names and where they live. In the case of the Cathars, they were required to, quote, carry from now on and forever, I'm quoting, two yellow crosses on all their clothes, except their shirts. And one arm shall be two palms long, while the other transversal arm shall be a palm and a half long, and each shall be three digits wide, with one to be worn in front of the chest and the other to be worn between the shoulders. Wait, what? Yeah, they had to wear a badge of distinction. They had to wear a yellow cross or badges. Now, what happens, this sounds very familiar, this will go on with uh, the Inquisition, and later on in Spain, they will apply this strategy to the Jewish community and then, of course, later on, that idea will be, yeah, will be revived under the Nazi regime. This is where these ideas come from. The Inquisition comes up with this idea. Isn't this horrendous? Wow. Now, after a while, the yellow cross or badge became too worn or torn or even lost. So what are you supposed to do, right? They were required to go to the Catholic authorities to get a new one. Meanwhile, good Catholics were encouraged to shun such offenders, now easily uh, done with these blatant badges for them all to see. The crosses were called uh, in the Occidental dialect, Las uh, Disbandores, which means uh, translated reels or winding machines. Why do they call them winding machines? Because it's the belief that with this mark, there are always potential heretics and may be easily reeled in by the Catholic authorities at that time. Wow, that's really bad. Yeah, really bad. So we're still, for those found guilty the first time around, uh, for they were to lose half of their property to the church as a fine for their heresy. Eventually, you can see where this is going. Many wealthy people with substantial properties became targets for the Inquisition, feeding the, the coffers of the church if found guilty. A good way of creating more revenue for the church is just to find a, uh, just to accuse a bunch of wealthy people of, through the Inquisition of heresy. And this happened a lot. Uh, and uh, they're taken care of. As the Inquisition became more corrupt, the Dominicans expanded, yes, the Dominicans expanded the trials against heresy to the even the deceased who died before they were brought to trial. So they actually would dig up these heretics, tried their bones, and when found guilty, they seized half of their lands from their heirs. So it's like, oh no, you know, you'd you inherited something from your dad. Your dad's found guilty of heresy. But what's going to happen uh, is a you know is they dig up dad, they excommunicate dad who passed away, and and you lose half your property. It really corrupt. This is the worst. Those convicted of heresy for the second time by the church were then to be handed over uh, to the state for execution. Uh, I'm going to quote from so when those. A judge guilty of heresy had been given up to the civil power, the bishop, 
or his representative or the Inquisition, the Podesta or chief magistrate of the city shall take them at once, I'm quoting, and shall within five days at most execute the laws made against them, unquote. I have lots of primary sources here. The state also received an appropriate amount also of the heretic's property. Wait, the state also received something? So you mean the church gets something, but the state also gets something or the province? So this is a win-win for these individuals. It sure is. Of course, uh, concerns are raised over those who, foresaw, who oversaw the tortures of heretics. And so in 1256, the Pope mandated that all the inquisitors were to receive immediate absolution if they use instruments of torture. You mean they got immediately forgiven for torturing people? Uh-huh. Who did that? The Pope in 1256. Now, the Dominicans developed very cruel methods of opposing this Inquisition uh, with the consuls of Carcassonne writing the following to the Inquisitor Jean Galan. So this is the consul of Carcassonne. So let's Let's, let's go to the next image. I, I do have some interesting images here. Um, uh, so we'll go there. Um, so all right, there's there's the Inquisitor Court. That's a good image. Very good. Yeah, go to the next one. Your Dominicans, you can see them there. Okay. I'm not sure how long it would take this image, but uh, this is the wheel. Let's go to the next one. I'm not sure if I want to be staring at it very long. This is the rack. Okay, let's go to the next one. I guess there's no good images of these. Okay, let's 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 put this one down. Thank you. It gets you the idea. I don't want to be looking at these images. Uh, they're just too upsetting for me. Uh, the Dominicans, again. Um, so this is a primary source. Okay, so once again, uh, this is the Consul of Carcassonne, who's writing the following to the Inquisitor by the name of Jean Galon. He says as follows to this inquisitor. He says, contrary to the practice and custom of your predecessors, you have created a prison called the wall, which would be better called hell. In it, you have constructed small cells to inflict pain and to mistreat people using various types of torture. Some cells are so dark and airless that those imprisoned there cannot even tell whether it is night or day. They permanently lack air and light. In other cells, the miserable prisoner remains in fetters of either wood or metal and are unable to move. They excrete and urinate where they are and cannot lie down except on their backs on the cold earth. In other places uh, in the prison, they lack air and light and also food, except the, he says, the bread of adversity uh, and the water of affliction which are provided only rarely. Some are placed on the chivile, uh, which is the rack. Many of them have lost the use of their limbs because of the severity of the torture and are rendered entirely powerless. Life for them is such an agony and death is a relief. Under these constraints, they affirm as true what is false, uh, preferring to die once than to thus be tortured multiple times. They accuse not only themselves, but also others who are innocent in order to escape their suffering in any way. Those who so confess reveal afterwards that what they have said to the brother inquisitors, who are the Dominicans, is not true, but false, and that they had confessed out of fear of the peril of the moment. To some of those witnesses that you cite, you promise immunity so that they will more freely denounce others without fear, unquote. This is bad. The chivalet, of course, is the rack where the arms and legs are strapped to a table and gradually pulled further and further apart if the person is not responding properly. Eventually, there is a snap in the cartilage as the arms and legs are pulled out of their sockets. Another device used was called a head crusher, with the person's chin placed on a lower bar that is connected via a screw to a metal cap placed on top of the head, which is then slowly turned until the teeth break and the skull fractures. With the Iron Maiden, 
uh, a person is positioned in an upright coffin shaped box, which has a lid of sharp spikes that are slowly closed upon the person. And of course, upon complete closure, the person would eventually die. With the strapado, the person's arms were tied above their head and the hang suspended. At various intervals, they were suddenly dropped, dislocating the arms of the person in the process. With the wheel, which you saw, this device was rolled over the person's body, and because it was spiked, it would impale them as they did so. The heretic's fork was basically a metal collar with a two forks moving laterally from it, with one pointing uh, towards the chest and the other under the neck, forcing the person to keep his head up or otherwise piercing himself. So you got to keep it up or otherwise piercing himself. With the water torture, about eight quarts of water are poured down the victim's mouth as their nose is plugged, giving them the sensation of drowning. This is what they're doing in the name of the church. This is what they're doing. Yeah, it's very upsetting. And so once now armed, this institution that was created to address uh, the, the Cathars were getting, obviously, to get wiped out, and the remnant gets wiped out through the Inquisition. There's also another target that they have. That's right. The Waldensians. The Waldensians? Yeah. Have you heard of them before? A lot of people haven't, although I've had one of my students one time uh being a, a surviving Waldensian. Basically, the Waldensians are, are, are Protestants before we know Protestants exist, and they're so forgotten because they wiped out so many of them. Peter Waldo is the founder of the Waldensians. Uh, he lived from 1140 to 1218. He was a wealthy merchant from Lyon. Yes, again, France. He founded this layman movement known as the Waldensians, which focused on preaching and voluntary poverty, as well as emphasizing Christianity upon the Bible, and a Bible that was not in Latin, but a Bible that was in a local vernacular language so all could read and understand it. This is Remember, he's 1140 to 1218. We don't get the Protestant Reformation until the 1500s. So he's doing this in the 1200s, and we have to wait to the, the 1300s, the 1400s, and the 1500s for this to happen. And yet, we can see right away uh, how the Protestant movement is really inspired by this individual. Waldo uh, made his drastic change in life, uh, uh, em embracing uh, a life of voluntary poverty for uh, a few reasons. Uh, one of the reasons, of course, first of all, Waldo was influenced by the life of St. Alexis of Rome. <laughs> Uh, according to the story, Alessis fled from Rome before his arranged marriage, leaving his father, uh, who was a wealthy Christian Roman uh, from the senatorial class. He ended up in the city of Edessa in Syria. Alexis put on the outfit of a beg beggar and asked for alms. When his father's servants came to look for him, Alexis incognito uh, begged for alms from them. Returning to Rome, he was totally changed from his parents to the point where he was not recognized, not recognized at all. Uh, and, and so he was just seen as a simple beggar devoted to God. And so his parents, not knowing his identity, uh, took him in. And he lived in a small niche below the chairs. Here he spent his time teaching catechism to children and praying. After 17 years living there, Alexis died. Uh, it was at this point that his family found papers on him, revealing them him to be actually their lost son. And so he was inspired by this individual. And of course, obviously, this, this story uh, is brought over from the east uh, to the west. With the, when the Greek metropolitan Sergius of Damascus was exiled and arrived in Rome, and Pope Benedict uh, VII gave him the virtually abandoned church of St. Boniface in Aventine Hill in 972. And so he's Waldo is part of this group. So the idea is volunteered. Poverty. Poverty was number one. Second, Waldo could not agree with the Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation. He didn't believe that the bread uh, and wine became the literal body and blood of Christ. Uh, he said that, uh, and to, to say that, by the way, if he actually said that it was not true, transubstantiation, it was considered a capital offense. It was considered death. Third, 
Waldo had difficulty accepting the idea of purgatory, uh, saying that it was an invention of the Antichrist. He said when one died, he believed they went right to heaven. And those who, who didn't believe what the hell, I guess. Fourth, he rejected the idea of the veneration of relics of saints. And the, in fact, the entire cult of the saints in general. He believed that this was actually a morbid cult. Fifth, uh, mystical energies and curatives were simply nonsense. A uh, holy water is just rainwater. Six, he believed that uh, priests should not be that, that 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 important. In fact, he said that there should be a universal priesthood. Uh, adding that uh, that you can pray to God in a barn as even as well as a church. Um, and seventh, the death of his close friend uh, made him realize that uh, material things are no good but also that we need to give all to those who are hungry, uh, who are needy, who are the poor. So this is the movement which parallels Martin Luther. So, of course, one more, number eight, the ability for the followers to understand the Bible, uh, if literate, to read it for themselves. And so he advocated the translation of the Bible from, uh, from Latin uh, into his own uh, uh, language, which is Arpitan, which is the language of Franco Provence. And this, this was undertaken between 1175 to 1185. Waldo also took issue with the corruption of the church. Uh, he said that they, they were they were the harlot of revelation. <laughs> um, uh, and so uh they were, and of course, this movement they're known as the poor of of, of Lombardy. So in 1179, old Waldo, this is going to be received very well. Old Waldo went to Rome and approached the Pope Alexander and the Roman Curia to discuss the movement. Waldo told them that he believed in the universal uh, priesthood of all believers. <laughs> uh, he told them, uh, you know, he wanted to be part of this voluntary uh, poverty movement. Do you, what happens, of course, is almost immediately uh, this movement is condemned, right? Uh, the Third Lateran Council uh, viewed Waldo uh, and his ideas as worthy of condemnation, but uh, he was not excommunicated as of yet. But almost immediately, Waldo's followers were driven out of Lyon, and uh, of course, the, the Inquisition is now, the wheels are starting to move, and they moved to the south of Provence and Piedmont, living in the valleys here and there, trying to continue their ideals. But then Pope Lucius III, uh, who reigned from 1181 to 85, officially excommunicated Waldo. Still, Waldo continued. And since his views are, are understood as heretical, anyone mentioning that they believed in the universal priesthood of all believers or that the Bible should be the local language were now the potential targets of the Inquisition. And they would ask those specific questions. Do you believe in the universal priesthood of believers? If they did, you're a Waldensian. You're, you're going. It's over for you. You must believe everything else. And so what happens is in Strasbourg, 80 Waldensians were burned at the stake as a result uh, in 1211, charged with espousing heretical ideas. In the Fourth Lateran Council, 1215, the entire movement of the Waldensians was declared as heretical. At this point, persecutions began, and soon the wheels of the Inquisition got even worse, because now it is it is powered by the uh, Dominicans. Uh, in one year alone, 12,000 Waldensians were arrested and tried in Italy, and 9,000 9, were put to death. Because the Waldensians openly admitted that they believed in the universal priesthood of believers, that transubstantiation was not valid, that the Bible should be the vernacular, and the cult of the saints was a sham, the Inquisitor's job was made easy, permitting very quick ordeals and immediate deaths. In one day, for example, uh, 150 were burned alive at Grenoble in 1393. It's, it's, it's a slaughter. The Pope Innocent, now the eighth, from 1484 to 1492, issued the papal bull of excommunication in 1487, uh, and with Alberto di Capazzani, the Archduke of Cremona, organizing a crusade against them. Throughout Piedmont, 
Charles the First, Duke of Savoy, the ruler of these territories, had had enough, and he stopped this crusade and told the Waldensians he would let them live in peace. Not that many were left, uh, so many fleeing to the nearby Provence. But during the Protestant Reformation, the Swiss and French re re reformers view the Waldensians as being an early precursor of their movement. Uh, in fact, in October 12, 1532, the Waldensians uh, uh, joined the Reformed Church. But this did not help the, the Waldensians in Catholic territory for the French king. Francis I viewed the Waldensians as spreading sedition and ordered their massacre in Provence in 1545, sending an army of 2,000 to go from village to village, killing every Waldensian they could find. How do they know? Hundreds and hundreds die. How do they know? The Inquisition. The Inquisition figured them out. They, 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 had them, they had them all listed, ready for the slaughter. And then in January 1655, the Duke of Savoy decided to force the Waldensians of Piedmont to convert, ordering them all to attend Catholic Mass within 20 days, or they had to sell the property and move to the upper valleys. The majority simply moved. Frustrated by this strategy uh, that didn't, didn't work, the Duke decided to kill them all on April 24th, 1655, which became known as the Easter Piedmont Massacre. Peter Lage records, now I'm reading another source, Peter Lage records, little children were, I can't read all this because it's too upsetting, little children were torn from the arms of their mothers, clasped by their tiny feet, and their heads dashed against the rocks or were held between two soldiers and their quivering limbs torn up by the main force. Their mangled, I can't mangle bodies, that's all. It's dismemberment tied in trees. It's, it's, just, it's, it's, it's too bad. It's, 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 it gets, what I read was not the worst of it. So, target number two. Target number three, the spiritual Franciscans. So before we go there, Let's take a look at some images because we probably need to. Waldensians, oh God! So let's take a look at the. <coughs> so so there's there's Peter Waldo right there. Uh yeah, this is the image of the Waldensians being persecuted. You can see what's going on here. On uh, the next image, that's pretty far, but you get the idea. Uh, next image. Uh, all right, yeah. Let's, let's. This is good. The spiritual. Franciscans, also known as the Fratesini or the Little Brothers. Unlike other Franciscans, by the way, they're still around, believed to be true to their movement that most uh, of them observed exactly how St. Francis himself had demonstrated. They are the purest. They want to follow exactly how St. Francis of Assisi practices belief. They practiced a very strict sense of poverty. Uh, they preached, but they also believed in complete uh, humility. They also had this concept of absolute empathy and hospitality and kindness and love, especially those in need. They emerged during the 1270s, causing much division. To deal with this new faction, some of the leaders of the order decided to be uh, to actually throw them in jail. The first, of course, being Peter, seen here, uh, Jean Olivier, uh, in 1283. Peter Jean Olivier taught that the arrival of St. Francis marked the advent of a new spiritual age. I'll go to the next picture. Which would lead to the eventual second coming of Christ. But before this happened, the church would become corrupt, making ready for the arrival of the Antichrist, who would assume leadership of the church. This new evil church, as led by the Antichrist, will persecute true spiritual Christians. Olivi taught his followers to remain steadfast, for they only had to endure suffering for a short while, for soon after Christ would appear. Uh, Jean Olivi asserted that humans naturally had free will to decide between right and wrong within themselves. To demonstrate this, he paired up opposites which we were fully capable of. So there's a one side, there's zeal, and the other side, there's mercy. On one side, there's friendship, and the other side is hostility. There's shame and glory, gratitude, ingratitude, subjugation, domination, 
hope and distrust and carefreeness and heedlessness. If free will was not possible, neither would of these pairs, asserted Olivi. Uh, he declared that every human uh, being senses with complete certainty within himself that they have this free will, and that in essence, its free will is the cause of its motion when it is moved, and the cause of its rest when it's rested. And why follow the simple life of St. Francis, he says? This is pursued, I love this, solely and purely because of the love of justice, and never because of force or manipulation. For then such an aim is not valid, but counterfeit. Yet through their example, uh, he continued, he wished people to do what is righteous before God. For he said, quote, we do not intend simply to move someone towards what is good, but rather to make it that he voluntarily move himself towards the good. He did not believe that you could be forced to do good. He believed you had, you had a choice to do good and that you should not be forced to do good. It should be your, you can imagine what the church uh, as well uh, as those who are the Dominicans and the Inquisition are thinking, uh-uh, uh-oh, no, no, no. Because their whole thing is forcing people to be good through fear, through intimidation, through torture. And these spiritual Franciscans, unlike the other Franciscans who at that time compromised, uh, these ones uh, are speaking about a different ideal. Love? What's that about? Well, apparently that's, you know, supposed to be important. Olivia also did not like Aristotle saying, without reason, he is believed uh, as the god of this age. He didn't like Aristotelian logic. So then the spiritual Franciscans were declared as heretics by Boniface VIII in 1296, but were soon forgiven by the next decade, with Olivia released from prison as well as to die a free man in 1298. But his tomb soon became the center of veneration along with his writings. To stop his popular sainthood, the general chapter of Leon declared his writings as heretical in 1299, with all of them ordered and gathered up and burned. But the spiritual Franciscans continued to increase in number, and their leadership again began to throw them into prisons. Clement V attempted to intervene in the controversy, hoping for a compromise, but neither side would have it. The spiritualists further created havoc by claiming certain uh, convicts as their own. In 317, Pope John uh, the 22nd ordered the spiritual Franciscans to submit to the authority of the community or they would face the Inquisition. Those who refused faced the Inquisition and imprisoned, and then they were burned at the stake in 318. Meanwhile, the same year, the tomb of Olivi was destroyed so as to end any focal point for this movement amongst both spiritualists and Benguines. Of course, his writings were again declared as heretical and were ordered destroyed by the general chapter of Marseille. All right, so, whew. okay, next image. So these are the spiritual Franciscans. Uh, there they are, uh, unfortunately, suffering. Okay, go to the next one. I think that's the end of those, Fran yeah, oh yeah. Another image there, that's good, that's a Francis. Thank you. Okay, so after the death, Oh, you do want to hear this part, okay? Because now we're moving to the Templars. Yeah, next. After the death of Benedict uh, the, the 11th in 1304, a dispute arose between the Italian French cardinals over who should be the next pope uh, that drained on for, for years. Eventually, uh, Clement, Pope Clement V, who reigned from 1305 to 1314, was elected. Right from the beginning, his elevation uh, defied tradition. For while most of the posts were Italian, uh, Clement was French. And unfortunately, he proved to be simply the puppet of the French monarch by the name of Philip IV, uh, who reigned, uh, so actually he, he lived, uh, so basically 1285 to 1314. He wished to undo many of the harsh edicts against his authority as the French king and uh, uh, as issued by the previous pope, especially the parts uh, known as Unum Sanctum, which was issued on November 18, 1302, which asserted that spiritual authority was stronger than secular authority. Now with his hands free, 
Philip IV could work through Pope Clement uh, to take care of this his perceived uh, competition. Philip believed <clears throat> that the Knights Templar had gained too much power. And so Clement proposed that this uh, order of prestigious knights should merge with the knights hospitallers. The Templars were quite wealthy by this time, uh, declared as rich as kings. The, while ho the hospitallers uh, had far more manners, uh, numbering about 19,000. The Templars had 9,000. However, their, uh, their uh, manners were far larger, extensive. So the very same year uh, that he became Pope, Clement sent messages to both Templar Master Jacques de Molay and Hospitaller Grandmaster Alfoc de Velay about combining their orders. And they both thought this was a very bad idea. But uh, Clement was determined and in 1306 instructed that they were to meet him to continue this conversation. Uh, because uh, the head of the hospitalers could not get to the meeting for a few months, Divole, here we go, of the Templar, was forced to spend more time with Clement in early 1307. And while waiting for the other esteemed knight, Clement informed Divole that a knight, formerly of his order, was, was uh, making some charges against them. He said that they were worshiping demons and doing other kinds of atrocities. Uh, this uh, They called him the new Pontius Pilate. Uh, this is uh, Philip Lebel. Uh, they also call him the Scourge of France. And he did have his motivations, of course, for he is playing the right part on this complicated political game, uh, especially with Philip. Uh, uh, and so what happens is Philip himself Philip was greatly in debt to the Knights Templar. He owed them so much money. So, in fact, he was infamous for not being able to balance his own books. He just kept borrowing and borrowing. So what's a good way to get out of debt? Since the Knights Templar are the ones who are loaning all this to him, he's supposed to pay them back. Well, maybe the best way is to charge them with heresy, and then as a result, oh, oh, um, get rid of those people and be out of debt. You just kill those who you who, who owe you money. So, and also, the Templars, they own so much property, so if they're, he was successful in accusing them, the King of France could also gain their lands, and so move these lands from church ownership to state ownership. It's a great deal. You just got to figure out how to do this? Hmm. How do we do this? So, so a plan was created. Uh, it started on the morning of Friday, October 13th, 1307, Friday the 13th. De Molay and 60 other Templars were seized by Philip's troops and arrested in Paris. The warrant declaring that God is not pleased. We have enemies of the faith in the kingdom because it was a heresy charge. Guess whose responsibility? Yeah, that's right. The Inquisition, here we go. The Inquisition, yes. And so now the Inquisition now has to try these Templars. Of course, the Inquisition managed to find heresy that they were so vigorously looking for. Uh, the denouncing or spitting on the cross was a common charge. Uh, and this occurred during the initiation into the order, it was said. One night under torture declared, I actually have the sources right here, declared. Uh, I have it in French here. Uh, go, go. Oh, oh, I, I have it. Okay. I, Ramon de la Fer, 21 years old, admit that I have spat three times on the cross, but only from my mouth and not from my heart, they told the inquisitors. Um, uh, Ramon de Caron, which is different, that's not la Fer, there's a lot of common names, was taken aside after his initiation by a brother servant, showed a small cross or crucifix, and told, You must announce this one. To which Ramon replied, and so I denounce. Geoffrey of Chaunay was taken aside by the brother who initiated, shown a crucifix with the effigy of Christ, and was told that he should not believe in the crucified, but should in fact denounce him. 
Uh, and so we have just a list of all these constantly. I have, I have the lists here. Okay, another claim against them was sodomy. But all the inquisitors established was that Raymond de Caron and Hugo de Poulon uh, knew that three other knights were arrested for this offense and imprisoned at the Castle Pilgrim for this uh, for this for this charge. Raymond de Caron said that during the, his initiation, that if he found himself not able to control his lust, he was uh, said to take care of us secretly. But there's no mention of sodomy. Hugo said he was one of those who told the knights during the initiation to refrain from also partnerships with women, but it doesn't necessarily mean sodomy. So there's an absence of evidence. One of the most serious charges was the accusation of idolatry. Uh, so uh, just just for let's let's, let's take a look uh, at some images here. Uh, so we've got the Knights Templar. Although just what images they uh, were? Okay, this is uh, this is the uh, Clement. This is this Pope Clement, uh, right right there. Sorry, the earlier one. Go back. Sorry, go back. Uh, Philip the Fair. That's Philip the Fair, who's uh, is not fair at all. And now back the other direction. And this is, of course, thank you so much, Margie. Uh, and this is Clement. Let's go to the next image. Uh, we don't have any real good pictures of of the head of the Templar Order, and I apologize ahead of time. Uh, so, but uh, this is Jacques de Boulay. Uh, at least gives you an idealized version. You see uh, the uh, the Templar cross there. I'll go to the next image. Uh, this is a good image, uh, contemporaneous of the Templars. Go to the next image. That's great. Love it. Yeah. So this is, of course, connected to um, some of the images that they were found idolatry. Although just what image they worship was discreet upon. In one version, they worshiped a mummified severed head. Some presume that this may have been a relic related to John the Baptist, who was beheaded at the request of Herod Antipas's daughter, Salome. This head was related to ceremonies connected to the Temple Mount, where they originally based. The head was supposedly referred to, according to what the Inquisitors found out, referred to as a savior, and so automatically leaves out the belief that it was the, the head of Hugh de Paines, uh, who is the founder of the Templars. But John the Baptist was often viewed as a savior figure, so maybe uh, maybe there's a connection there. I don't know. We know a little about the relic of John the Baptist's head uh, earlier on. According to the early Christian uh, legend, Herod Antipas sent the head to Damascus, and then later on it was enclosed in the church during the reign of Theodosius, but eventually it was transported to Constantinople. During the sack of Constantinople by the Fourth Crusade in 1204, Robert D. Clary, who was one of the crusaders, plundered uh, the Bukalin Palace. Uh, and um, and so and here they found the robe of Our Lady and the head of my Lord John the Baptist. That's a quote. From here, many churches then claimed to receive this head of John the Baptist, including the Cathedral of Amiens, France, and the Church of Saint Sylvester in Rome, Saint Chapelle in Paris, and Saint Mark's Cathedral in Venice. Of course, the conspiracy theories abound. One of the most interesting saying that the Templars actually discovered the mummified head of Jesus Christ, which opposed certain theological issues uh, concerning his believed bodily resurrection. The next part tells how the Pope told, supposedly told the Templars to keep this fact a secret so as not to destroy the credibility of their power base. Yet because this was a relic, the Templars believed to possess supernatural powers, supposedly, and develop rituals to harness those energies. These are all just rumors. Another possible source actually derives from the initiation ritual of the Muslim sect known as the Assassins, as led by the Old Man of the Mountain. In this initiation, the prospective Assassin to B was brought before a head of a man that was made to appear decapitated. But in reality, the head's a man's head was sticking through a hole in the floor with the rest of his body down below, the area around his collar tightly fitted with a basin filled with chicken blood. The initiate then asked questions of the head. I don't want to keep seeing this image, so let's go to the next one. But there is a head on there. You see there? Uh, there's, oh, okay. And since the person was actually alive, uh, they would receive answers. So you, basically they're talking to this, this head that's set on the table. Say, hey, this is things. Now, 
the talking head will tell them about all the pleasures and paradise as filled with uh, black-eyed virgins and all the other possibilities if they served the old man of the mountain. Uh, once this part was completed, they would actually cut off the head of this man out of sight and place it on a pole, at which point it would serve to legitimize, uh, leg to, to legitimize the belief that the man's head was actually dead at the time of the earlier conversation. Some have suspected that one of these heads got into the Templar's possession. The second version of the story had the Templars worshiping a figure known as Baphomet. The meaning of the word is often contested, but one, one view is that it relates to the Greek word Baphe Meteos, which translates as baptism of wisdom. Others say it derives from the Arabic word uh, Ubufamat, which means father of wisdom. Uh, still more assert that the name Baphomet is merely a corrupt word for Muhammad based upon how they pronounced it, Muhammad. Now, the first time, I want to say, the first time the word appears, Baphomet, was in a letter by Anselm of Ribon on July of 1098, who does state, as the next day dawned, they called loudly upon Baphomet, and we prayed silently in our hearts to God, then we attacked and forced all of them outside the city wall. So the very first time it ever appears at all, uh, it is used in the context of being Muhammad. doesn't mean that's the answer, but it's the first time it is extant uh, in records. To further a Muslim association, Ramon de Aguiaz, uh, one of the chroniclers of the First Crusade, calls the mosques of the Muslims Baphomeris, and I have the Latin right here. According to various admissions, the Templars gave salutations, Ya Allah. Uh, so these, remember, this is all information that the Inquisitors are finding. So I'm reporting what they're getting out of these Crusaders. So that's why we're talking about this. So they gave the salutation, Ya Allah, and Yala before this image, which would likely translate as Hail Allah or Hail God. Yet yeah. this declaration was most likely. Uh, maybe Yala Sidna, which means, O oh God, our Lord. Uh, for this phrase is found amongst various Templar alchemical symbols, which were seen right here, by the way. Uh, yet, for those of the Mandians, John the Baptist as their founder was called Yala. So it could also be Yala Sidna, John, our Lord. In the Burgundy Temple of the Templars, the lid of one of the sacred relics has an inscription, Yala Sidna, next to the head of a man. Uh, possible further connections uh, to this identification. At the center of this lid is a very odd figure, a bearded man with breasts and female genitals. Uh, go back to the earlier one. So this is the image here. Uh, thank you, Margie. There, yeah, there's, okay. So uh, at the very center of this lid, very odd, is a bearded man, you know, with a uh, uh, with breasts and female genitalia holding up in one hand a pole, uh, holding up the sun, the other holding up uh, the moon. Uh, so often an image connected to Baphomet is double-headed in various Templar engravings. Let's go to the next, uh, go to the next image and the next one. And the next one, and should be the double-headed image, I believe. There, it's not very well seen. Double-headed God Janus in many ways. Thank you so much. Good. Okay, so, uh, and, and the images, thank you so much, Margie. So Dimele was tortured beyond reason, the head of the Knights Order. Tortured beyond reason, 11 days straight, until he confessed to everything Philip Le Bel had said. Dimele confessed that part of the initiation of the Templars, including, quote, denying Christ and trampling on the cross. Uh, the Inquisition got that out of him. Next, Dimole was forced to write a letter telling all the other Templars to admit to these crimes? Wow! It broke him. The Inquisition broke him. The Dominicans broke this man. With his admission of guilt, Philip next sent out a message that the kings of Christendom need to arrest the Templars for their hideous crimes against God. Edward I of England, his rival, doubted the legitimacy of such an assertion and said, uh, that his country believed in a fair and impartial jury. 
Meanwhile, James of Aragon absolutely refused to comply. No, this is just Philip. Philip had crossed the line, declaring heresy, uh, following their inquisition before Clement. For once, Clement did not permit the French king to get away with a declaration that was not officially supported by him. He wrote to Philip, you have perpetuated these attacks on persons and goods of people directly subject to the Roman church. In this action of yours, everybody sees an insulting contempt for us and the church of God. So Clement dispatched two cardinals uh, from Rome to Paris to hear for himself. You know, forget the, forget the Inquisition. Forget Philip's power. What really happened? So, so Clement sends uh, these cardinals uh, to Paris to hear himself the confessions of the knights. And as a result, of course, now not under torture, they revoked their confessions. One knight even said that he was in such pain that he would have confessed killing God himself to stop the pain. Philip's own people considered his actions illegal, uh, uh, with lawyers from Paris University telling the king, uh, you know, he was unjustified to even consider a trial against de Molay. And so what happens is more manipulation. Uh, so uh, what happens eventually uh, is that, uh, is that uh, of course, somebody who is an official, uh, who is uh, in a high position uh a, a bishop had to decide the verdict of course the idea would be the bishop of rome so what philip did is before clement could make as a bishop of rome as the pope make his, his declaration what he did uh is he sent the archbishop philip uh the marinet of Sciences, whose archdiocese included paris on the case he said no this guy's doing the case of course because this individual just happened to be the brother of the king's chief financial minister, the outcome was a foregone conclusion. Through the authority of the church, all 54 Templars he examined were guilty as a result of heresy and were to be born, burned at the stake. And because of that, now the Pope has to follow the precedent of these bishops. And so on November 22nd, I know my birthday, 1307, there, the Pope Clement is now forced to order all Christian kings to arrest all Templars and take all their property and assets. And then, of course, obviously, uh, in 1312, um, you're going to have the Templar order is officially dissolved by Clement. And yes, uh, Philip gets away. And of course, what will happen is you have the burning of the stake of Dumoulin. There is, of course, this interesting story about the, the curse of Demolay. You know, God knows who is wrong. Uh, sorry, God know, knows who is wrong and who has sinned. Soon a calamity will occur to those who have condemned us to death. Uh, and, of course, soon after, uh, uh, it was reputedly Demolay. It's not. Uh, soon after, though, uh, there is death. Uh, in fact, what happens is that uh, right after this, Clement died, the Pope, on April 20th, 1314, after a long illness. And Philip IV died on November 29th, 1314, the very same year, a few weeks after suffering a stroke while hunting. He was only 45 at the time. So, so there's the declaration. What, what happened is um, uh, there was somebody that was watching at that time that said something to the effect. But really, there was also another Templar from Naples. In a later occasion that declared this version of the story, he says, from this, your heinous judgment to the living and true God who is in heaven, uh, then, of course, something bad will happen. So there you have it. Years before, uh, um, um, oh, I'll just say this. So, so the Inquisition got them. By the way, I want to say this. So when does the Inquisition, when do we finally get the records, all of them released? for the uh, Knights Temple. Well, guess what? It was only released, the Inquisition records, against the Templars, are only released to the public in 2007. 
2007? Shouldn't it have been before that time? Yeah. Wow. Yes, because it's so embarrassing. Yeah, and you can buy the whole copy if you want uh, for about uh, 5,900 euros. <laughs> uh, in this work, by the way, Clement actually asserts in this work that's finally released in 2007, he, he, Clement, he actually said this, that the Knights Templar were not guilty of heresy. Only a few were guilty for some minor crimes. As it turned out, the spitting on the cross was intended to be a ritual of obedience in case Muslims captured them. Oh, no. Now we have one more group. Actually, two and a half. But we've got to talk about this one. You want to hear this? What about an early movement of, of Christian women? What about that? In the early 12th century, many women began to seek an independent spiritual life based upon prayer and caring for others. But they did not take vows or alms. Uh, and um, and also and were free to charge uh, for whatever they made. This movement began uh, in the, what is now the Netherlands and Belgium. These women. Soon these women began to band together to become, because uh, of their common goals, they formed collectives. Uh, and they are called Binguages, each under a grand mistress, having their own unique rule, and all often focus upon uh, a particular means of living. Let's take a look at uh, the Binguines a little bit. The Binguines, Binguines. So, uh, so cloth making was very, very popular. There we go. Amongst these establishments in Flanders, quite a few of these Binguines were considered holy women. Inspired, uh, inspiring mystics believed to be close to God through their devotions. Let's go to the next image. Uh, by the 13th century, the Beguine culture was further diversified with, with increasingly more upon a life of mysticism as opposed to an individual or collective labor. And so it resulted in them maybe begging to support and wanting to do contemplative life full time. Now, this starts to cause a problem. You see, uh, and also they join the Franciscans. They become part of the third rule of St. Francis. And they have a little kinship with those known as the spiritual Franciscans. But here's the problem. The big weeds through their, through a, their, their mysticism got these visions and ideas and dreams and they're flowed through them said to be from God. And this was understood by many as authoritative. But this authority was looked at, at this time, as challenging church authority. Challenging church authority. And now that they're doing it full-time from the perspective of the church, this was even worse from their perspective. And so the big Guines by the early 14th century were in trouble with the church for many reasons. Uh, by, by the way, they were also not part of any official order, just this lay movement of the third uh, uh, rule of St. Francis. Uh, there was no way to correct uh, their theological innovations. Uh, they were uh, so independent, they were, kinder, they were free spirits. One by the name of Marguerite Forte was burned at the stake in Paris in 1310 for her very independent ways. By 1311, Pope Clement uh, V accused the Benguines of spreading heresy, destabilizing the church, and just all other kinds of mischief. <laughs> so Pope John XXII, uh, 1316 to 1334, also viewed the lay movement of the Benguines as troublesome uh, because of their zeal and their theological creativity and it was part, it was becoming a home movement, this homespun religious movement that was spreading all over and women were joining it. So, of course, the spiritual Francis, Franciscans were very popular amongst the big queens. So when Rome began to persecute the Franciscans, guess who helped out the spiritual Franciscans, the big queens? who were often a member of the third, as I said, third order of St. Francis. They protected their fellow brethren. 
Like the spiritual Franciscans, the Penguins believed in living a very simple life, modeling St. Francis and helping the poor. For them, Olivia was a saint as much as St. Francis was. So when Pope John uh, 22nd began to arrest the spiritual Franciscans and put them under the Inquisition as of 1317, and then proceeded to burn them, the spiritual Franciscans, at the stake as a result of the Inquisition in 1318, the Beguines began to hide the spiritualists in their homes. They wanted to protect them from persecution. In fact, they started to sneak them out of France via Majorca to Sicily, where they knew they would be safe. In response, John the 22nd decided to arrest the Beguines of southern France and likewise charge them of heresy. So they were now being burned at the stake. A certain uh, uh, Loresse Bisse was arrested, placed under the Inquisition, and admitted that she was char in charge of one of the, the base points along the coast where the Beguines were smuggled spiritually, uh, smuggling the, the spiritualists, the Franciscans, to Sicily. In fact, she said that she helped six such men and one of them being her cousin. Why, well, what's going on here? What's happening here is that you have this almost like this underground railroad idea where the spiritual Fra Franciscans are being snuck from point to point to get them out of France. Meanwhile, of course, uh, obviously the, the spiritual Franciscans uh, were, um, uh, uh, were were eventually, they eventually faded out for a while, but they've, they've actually come back. Of course, uh, you have under the Inquisition, you have Jan Hus uh, was also found himself under the Inquisition, right? And then the Catholic Church created a very organized demonology in relation to, well, witchcraft, revealing their supposed improprieties and outlining how the remedies uh, they believed defy, defy went against the laws of God. So guess what? The Inquisition machine was, was already um, attacking uh, Cathars and and um, and and uh, Waldensians and attacking Knights Templars and spiritual Franciscans and Benguines. And so just uh, why not add what's add witches to that list? So now this is the next list. And yes, the the Dominicans are still in charge. And so in the official capacity, edicts began to appear against uh, witchcraft. I want to say something about the word witchcraft. The word is, uh, the word is malficia or malficium. And the idea is doing malficium, doing evil acts, bad magic, bad magic. So whenever you see the word witchcraft translated for the continent, that's not the word. The word witch is not in the languages of the continent, right? So what will be, of course, uh, is that it will use the word malficia, right? Or they use the German word hexa. So you gotta be very careful. The word which is used in for English, right? And so it's used in areas where they speak English. That's where you get the word. So whenever you see the word which and it's pertaining to the continent, take out that word and put in bad magic or evil deeds or, or evil actions or evil magic. Put that in instead. So yes, they will accuse women of doing this, but they're not calling themselves witches in that place. Then a tradition. Got it? Got it? Okay, but still going to use for convenience sake. So it's against those who are or practitioners of malficium. So what will happen is, in official capacity, uh, edicts began to appear against uh, Malficia. I'll use the word Malficia. With the most sophisticated possible being the papal bull issued by Pope Innocent uh, the Eighth for parts of the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, let's go to the next image. I think we have a few more. Oh, this, this, oh, this is a beautiful Binguine. This is like one of their associates. It's still there. Go to the next image. Is there any more? Is that the last image? Okay, that's it. Okay, that's fine. We can close down on that then. Thank you. Good job. Thank you so much, Margie. So what happens? We're out of pictures. We're out of luck, right? Okay, so what's going to happen is, is that uh, there is a document, and it was issued in 1484. Uh, it is known as the Summus 
Desterantes Effectibus. The entire work was the work of two Dominican inquisitors, of course, right? The most prominent being Heinrich Kramer, who lived from 1430 to 1505, who is the general inquisitor of Salzburg, Tyrell, Bohemia, and Moravia. While the other was the lesser known Jakob Sprenger, a high degree of ignorance and local superstition really does permeate this text. For instance, at one point, this bull declares many persons of both sexes, uh, mindful of their own salvation and strain from the Catholic faith, have abandoned themselves to devils, incubi, and succubi, and by their incantations, spells, conj conjurations, and other accused charms and crafts, enormities and horrid offenses, have slain infants, yet in the mother's womb, as also the offspring of cattle, have blasted the produce of the earth, the grapes of the vine, the fruits of the tree, nay, men and women, beasts of burden, herd beasts, as well as animals of other kinds, vineyards, orchards, meadows, pasture land, corn, wheat, and all other cereals, these wretches furthermore afflict and torment men and women, beasts of burden, herd bursts, as well as animals of other kinds with terrible and piteous pains and sore diseases, both internal and external. They hinder men from performing the sexual act and women from conceiving. Whence husbands cannot know their wives, nor wives receive their husbands. Over and above this, they blasphemy and renounce the faith, which is theirs by the sacrament of baptism and at the instigation of the enemy of mankind, they do not shrink from committing and perpetuating the foulest abominations and filthiest excesses to the deadly peril of their own souls, whereby they out, outrage the divine majesty and are a cause of scandal and danger to very many. The abominations and normities in question remain unpunished, not without open danger to the souls of many and the perils of eternal damnation. We are here uh, to, you know, you know, to, yeah, exactly, right? We are there to save your soul. So, you know, so we're going to we're going to kill you while trying to do that, while trying to protect everybody else. You know, that's why we're here. That the effects of these, uh, those who stand condemned are all to do harm within a natural world with nothing of benefit uh, attributed to them. Hence, there is very, a very strong sense of malficium. Does that make sense? This is definitely malficium, evil deeds. You don't see anything that's connected to good deeds here. So once again, what's going to happen is when we get to uh, to uh, Great Britain, what's going to happen, or I should say England or Wales or Scotland, uh, the result of this will be as follows, uh, that um, uh, you'll be guilty not because of malficia by the deeds that you do. Uh, you'll be guilty just because you are called, because now they use the English word, just because you're called witch. So you're guilty by name, whether you're doing good or bad. But on the continent, you're guilty because you're doing perceived evil magic. But if you are perceiving doing good magic, then according to those documents, yeah, what happens is you're not doing, you're not doing magic. You're doing a miracle and you're doing something good. So, you know, if the person does something and the baby lives, it's a miracle. If some if the baby dies, oh, you're evil, you know, and uh, yeah, you're gonna have lots of problems like this, you know. Kepler, right? Kepler's mom, you know, uh, Kepler, obviously, when it comes to uh, his his views of astronomy, uh, his mom was one of these ladies who uh, who looked at the stars, got him all excited actually about looking into the heavens even when he's four years old she called him out come out take a look at the stars of course she could she put together stars astronomy with astrology and by the way kepler did the same thing but the point of the matter is that she did local herbs she's an innkeeper's uh a daughter she did various herbs and remedies and so forth uh but uh there was this lady I think her name is Ursula which is <laughs> kind of like uh, I was like the sea witch for little mermaid uh what happened is that she accused uh, her of making her sick. And so she gets accused of doing evil magic or malficium. And so so what happens is that the Inquisition comes, uh, they charge her, uh, and they beat her up. Uh, she's uh, And she's a mess. Uh, Kepler, of course, uh, 
eventually rescues her, but uh, it's, you know, she gets released, but she dies soon after because of terrible things uh, that the, um, that they did because she gave this lady something that made her sick. Now, if it, if, if she did make her sick, cause she had, a, she made a living doing this. If she didn't get sick, then it'd be like, Oh, you're God's with you. But it, yeah. You know, if the baby dies, like, as I said, you know, you're of the devil, the baby lives. It's a miracle. Really horrible time uh, to live, right? Terrible time. Now, many view the papal bull as politically motivated to empower those associated with the Inquisition. You think, especially the Dominicans, who were more obedient to Pope's wishes over that of the local German Catholic priests who were often compromised by their allegiance to their localities, especially the local princes. So, hey, which is a power, the Dominicans in the Inquisition, and scare people to see us in authority. While local authorities were threatened with excommunication, if they did not comply with these measures, the German nobility did their best to ignore the bull or to enforce it half-heartedly. Well, I guess we need stronger measures. So, here it comes. Inquisition, back at it again. <clears throat> the virtually ignored papal bull was followed by another work by the very same Kramer, uh, known as the Malleus Malficarium. Now, I want to say this. This is not, uh, in English, they'll translate it as a hammer of witches. You don't see the word witches there at all. It's Malficarium, right? Yeah, so we're once more back to Malficium. Uh, so against the hammer, against those who do uh, evil deeds. It was published in 1486, which eventually affected England more directly. When it is translated into English, then they will put the word witch there. But the word is, there's no witch uh, in Latin. There's no, and the equivalent is evildoer. And of course, once again, uh, hexa is equivalent in German. That's one who does hexa. So by its nature, uh, it's something that's evil. Okay. So what happens, according to Kramer in this work, he says, in the town of Rassenbaum, a certain young man who had intrigued with, was intrigued with a girl, wishing to leave her, I'm just reading, you know, lost his member. That is to say, some glamour was cast over it so that he could not see or touch nothing but his smooth body. In his worry over this, he went to a tavern to drink wine. I guess that's what happens uh, when you discover you lost your member through maybe magic. And after he had sat there for a while, uh, he got into a conversation with another woman who was there and told her the cause of his sadness, explaining everything and demonstrating uh, uh, that he actually demonstrated, he showed his nothing part uh, to her. The woman, the woman asked whether uh, he suspe suspected anybody, and yeah, he did name somebody, and he told the whole matter. He says, and she said, if persuasion is not enough, you must use some violence to induce her to restore you back to health. So in the evening, the young man watched the way by which the witch was in the habit of going. Once again, this is English translation, so the word witch is there. And finding her, prayed her to restore to him the health of his body. And when she maintained that she was innocent and knew nothing about it, he fell upon her and winding a towel tightly about her neck, choking her, saying, unless you give me back my health, you shall die at my hands. Then she, being unable to cry out and growing black, said, let me go, I will heal you. The young man then relaxed the pressure of the towel, and the witch touched him with her hand between the thighs, saying, now you have what you desire. And the young man, as he afterwards said plainly, felt before he had verified it by looking or touching that his member had been restored by him with a mere touch of the witch, unquote. So there we go. These are just strange little stories that, that the Inquisitors are coming up with. Uh, they seem to be getting too much into it. Still, there is a curious loophole. For according to one section, quote, when the person accused of heresy is not found to be one who casts injurious spells of witchcraft, but one who removes them, and in such a case, the procedure will be as follows. The remedies which she uses will either be lawful or unlawful. And if they are lawful, she is not to be judged a witch, but a good Christian. But we have already shown at length what sort of remedies are lawful. This is from part three, 
third head question uh, 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 34. So this is, what do you think, huh? Yet how was one to be sure if the person was either a witch or Malficia or a good Christian? According to the superstitious Malleus Malficarum, Kramer lists four criteria for deciding in the, in the Inquisition for deciding the presumed guilt as witches. For the first one, he states that there are some who can divine secrets and are able to tell things which they could only know through the revelation of evil spirits. For example, when the injured come to them to be healed, they can discover and make known the cause of their injury, and they can perfectly know this and tell it to them who consults them. Secondly, they sometimes undertake to cure the injury or spell one person, but will have nothing to do with that of another. So you can cure one, but you can't cure another. That must be somebody who's a witch. For in the Diocese of Spires, I've been to Spire, there is a witch, he says, in a certain place called Zonhofen, who, often as she seems to heal many people, confesses that she can in no way heal certain others. And this is for no reason then, as the inhabitants of the place assert, that spells <coughs> cast on such persons have been so potentially wrought by other witches with the help of devils that the devils themselves cannot remove them. So a devil can't remove a spell done by another devil. So therefore, <coughs> excuse me, if you can't remove a spell, that be that's that's because uh, somebody else, some other witch, had cast a spell on them uh, through another devil, through the, through the devil, and so they can't contradict each other. But if you're a good witch, I mean, sorry, good witch, sorry. If you're a sandwich, no. If you are a good Christian, then it doesn't matter. You can cure anybody because the devil alone. So for the one devil cannot or will not always yield to another. Thirdly, it sometimes happens that they must have some reservation or exception in their cure of such injuries. Uh, so he has that. I, I will kind of kind of skip through that because that's kind of long. Fourthly, they sometimes themselves observe or cause to be observed certain superstitions uh, and ceremonies. For instance, they fix some such time as before sunrise for people to visit them. Or they say they cannot heal injuries which were caused beyond the limits of the estate on which they live. Or they, they can only heal two or three people a year. Yet they do not heal them, but only seem to do so by ceasing to injure them. We could add many other considerations as touching the condition of such persons as that after the lapse of a certain time, they have incurred the reputation of leading a bad and sinful life, or that they are adulteresses or the survivors from covens of other witches. Therefore, their gift of healing is not derived from God on account of the sanctity of their lives. So, so much is being looked at at the kind of lives they live. If they live good lives, then they may not be of that. So once again, Oh, if you take a look at the continent, it's always Malfikian. It's always bad deeds, even though a person who's good will get accused of that. And you see how arbitrary that is. And it's a different story again on the Isles. Of course, the Malleus Malfikian, Malfikarium, excuse me, especially targets the midwives because of their association with natural remedies to aid with childbirth. I'm going to read this for, again. I'm reading from uh, these inquisitors. Here we must refer incidentally to witch midwives who surpass all other witches in their crimes, as we have shown in the first part of this work. And the number of them is so great that, as has been found, form their confessions. It is thought that they there is scarcely any tiny hamlet in which at least one is not found, and that the magistrates may in some degree meet this danger they should allow no midwives to practice without having been first sworn as a good Catholic. So if you're a midwife, first sworn as a good Catholic, at the same time observing other safeguards mentioned in the second part of this work. Now, obviously, <clears throat> the political uh, implications become obvious when Kramer uh, focuses on local German lords, asserting that when they become, quote, patrons by omission, quote, unquote, in Quote, in regards to such wizards and suspects, or to their followers, 
receivers, defenders, and patrons, when they neglect to perform their duties as required by the bishop or the inquisitors, that is, by failing to arrest them, I'm still quoting, by not guarding them carefully when they are arrested, by not taking them to the place within their jurisdiction which have been appointed by them, by not promptly executing the sentence passed upon them, and by other such derelictions of their duty, then, of course, you're in trouble. Again, this is a power struggle where Cramer hopes the church authorities will obey without question concerning heresy. This was a very convenient church tactic since so many were believed to oppose the will of the Pope, and they suddenly found themselves as heretics and subjects to the Inquisition. So, we're okay. We're at the very last group, and you, of course, want to hear this one, the Spanish Inquisition. Oh, all right. We're doing this. Okay. And then we have a surprise ending. A surprise ending? Yeah. Before we consider the direct causes leading to the expulsion of the Jews of 1492, we must realize that despite <clears throat> all the adventures, sorry, all the advances, excuse me, of individual Jews, the community as a whole, while tolerated, were never fully accepted uh, and integrated into uh, the Christian Spain. For example, this fact is made clear uh, by the Cité uh, Partidas of Alfonso X of Castile, 1252-84. Uh, Similar to the Islamic law concerning Christian churches, now no new synagogues <clears throat> could be built, nor beyond minor repairs, could they be made, I'm, I'm actually reading from it, any larger or raised to any greater height or be painted? And if this occurs, the building shall belong to the main church in the vicinity. So you can't, so basically minor repairs to the synagogue. If you do any more, congratulations, it's a church. Uh, the regulations also um, in, um, indulges in restrictions that are more a product of local lore and fantasy than reality, uh, declaring against Jews who make a practice of, quote, stealing children and fastening them to crosses and making images of wax and crucifying them when they cannot obtain children. Oh, man, that's pretty bad. However, in many, unquote, in many ways, this piece of legislation is more sympathetic to Jews than Muslims because it makes certain provisions that, yeah, but the Sabbath is still holy. So, so they can, you know, so as a result, it was forbidden to bring them into court. I'm, I'm actually quoting again uh, on account of debt or arrest them or cause them any other annoyance on that day, on the day of the Sabbath. Well, there's just still problems. The thread for the cause of the Jewish expulsions are many. And, of course, obviously the Inquisition is directly part of it, and the Dominicans. It really is a uh, multi-variegated tapestry of intrigue and miscommunication, as well as misguided efforts to spiritual reform potential wayward Christians. These are all my words, by the way. That's the way I write. I'm sorry. One of these reforming groups was a Dominican order, as I mentioned before, known as the Dominicans. <clears throat> and uh, what happened is this, is that... Um, uh, Ramon, a certain Dominican, uh, D. Ponfort, uh, uh, basically outlined an ideal that whereby uh, 10 Jews and Saracens together with 10 friars of religion should learn the holy law, after which they preached our law to other Jews and to the Saracens of our holy faith. However, uh, not all Dominicans subscribe to peaceful pursuits of uh, conversion of the Jews to Christianity. One of them is, um, so here we go. So um, uh, especially, of course, uh, towards the conversos. Uh, and so I'm going to kind of skip there because I want to go too much. Uh, one of them, thus in 1391, the Dominican uh, Ferrant Martinez, uh, through his passionate preaching, convinced that he's a Dominican, obviously connected, right? Convince an unruly mob to eliminate their common foe and destroy the Jewish quarter of Sevilla. After 4,000 Jews were slaughtered 
and even more supposedly converted, becoming conversos, and 23 synagogues destroyed, the anti-Semitic rage spread to this Dominican's own town of, of, of Ikja, uh, Ikja, excuse me, where he was the arch uh, uh, deacon and to Carmonia. Subsequently, then terror appeared in Toledo, where all those unwilling to embrace the precepts of Christianity were slain. A certain rabbi by the name of Judah from the proud line of Rabbi Asher Yao says, quote, slit the throats, he actually is, is, is basically slit the throats of his wife and children and then his own rather than convert. This is from the source, the expulsion, 1492, Chronicle number four. Eventually, after Catalonia and even the Balearic Islands, over 70 Jewish communities were destroyed with 50,000, 50,000 Jews slaughtered and over 100,000 supposedly converted over to Christianity, obviously using the Inquisition. Uh, in fact, uh, when the Jews encountered another radical Dominican, uh, Ferrer, I told, which I mentioned earlier, uh, he had another uh, attack as well. Um, in fact, uh, there's mention of one Castilian city uh, to the other with a torch in one arm and crucifix in the other. Uh, he led hostile mobs throughout the place. This is pretty messed up. I mean, I want to abbreviate this a little bit. You get the point. It's more blood and more gore. Since the first generation of conversos were brought to the baptismal font with a knife at their throats, the genuine nature of true conversion was always in question. And for the most part, the new Christians in pre-expulsion Spain were Christian in name, but not so in spirit. Many wanting to return to the religion of their Jewish forefathers. Uh, so what will happen is not that every conversal retained their Jewish faith. Some of them radically became, uh, to prove their, their faith, be radically became part of, uh, of the persecution. We have actually a list of, of many uh Jews like Yahshua Halorki, uh, who became active in persecuting his own people. Okay, so I'm moving to the to more stuff here, drinking here. Okay, so here we go. Inquisition. What happens now is according to Autos de Fe, contains many descriptions of this Inquisition. It intensified according to the charter of the expulsion of the Jews after 1480. In order to cleanse uh, those suspect Christians from their Judaizing activities, the reconciled were then the reconciled were then marched after the Inquisition. They were marched in procession to the local cathedral, both men and women. It said without cloaks, bareheaded, barefoot, and holding an unlit candle in their hands. The public disgrace was agonizing, and many went shrieking with pain and weeping, tearing out their hair, according to this source from that time, uh, February 12th, 1486. After hearing their heretical crimes, it was ordered that as long, I'm just quoting, as long as they should live, they could hold no public office, nor could they be money changers, apothecaries, or spice merchants, or will silk or fine scarlet wool, or colored clothing, or gold, or silver. Of course, the irony is that these were many of the traditional trades of the Jews in Spain. Those who did, did not repent were paraded on foot, I'm reading from the source, and with canonical mitters on their heads, and with their hands tied to the back of their necks with a piece of rope, they were brought to a, a tiered platform where their crimes were heard, and then brought to a plane where they were burned, unquote. Again, the source from August. Now, uh, this one sourced from August of 1486. Uh, so you're hearing this uh, directly. Um, the Inquisition trials were often a mess and filled with neighborhood gossip and local animosity against certain individuals. In the case of uh, Inez Lopez, she was tried twice by the Inquisition. Uh, 1495 to 96 and 1511, 1512. She believed uh, she was accused of Judaism because many of her neighbors stole from her. 
two pieces of ribbon in the case of Teresa Munoz, or were offended by what she said, like revealing the local holy women, woman, excuse me, Juana Torres had given birth out of wedlock to a son and, son and a daughter. <laughs> so what happens to her original sentence? Ines Lopez could be heard uh, explaining, she says, according to the records, see how my life hangs on the words of a drunken man or a drunken woman? <clears throat> Unquote. So she was tried for observing some Jewish fasts and holidays and for having, quote, little desire to eat pork. Ines Lopez claimed she had only, quote, been reconciled so that they wouldn't burn her at the stake as they did to her sister. And even though she believed she had never done any of those things that were attributed to her, hoped that the Lord would preserve her from false witness. She was, anyway, found guilty, burned at the stake anyway. Under this kind of pressure, it only became expected that the inquisitors mentioned by Ferdinand and Isabella found so many guilty of Judaism that they felt action had to be taken to stop this problem. Uh, also, of course, uh, you're going to have uh, the dealing out of various badges uh, to uh, yellow badges to identify Jews. That will be another thing that, that will be issued out in Spain. I want to bring that up. And so in the charter for the expulsion of the Jews of 1492, the two Spanish monarchs list various reasons why they believe the Jews should leave Spain. However, the main reason was the fact that Christians, quote, engaged in and continue to engage in social interaction and communication with Jews. Furthermore, they believe the Jews, uh, quote, seek always and by whatever means and ways they can to subvert and to steal faithful Christians from the our holy Catholic faith, unquote. Therefore, they felt that in order to prohibit all interactions between Jews and Christians, I'm still reading from it, that there will be not a place where they further offend our holy faith and corrupt those who God until now most desired to preserve. They need to be removed, the principal cause of the problem, and banish the Jews from the kingdom. Wow. So this is just a terrible thing. The deep anguish of this action caused the Jews, caused the Jews, which is beyond description. In Judah, Abravanel's heartfelt felt poem to his son, he tells of his separation from his son, he in Italy and his son, because of the force of circumstance in Portugal. He cries out against fate and time, who, quote, with his pointed shafts has hit my heart and split my gut, landed me a blow that will not heal, unquote. However, he exhorts his son to stay true to his traditions, including, quote, learning scripture, uh, conning the commentators, memorizing the Mishnah, reasoning out the Talmud with the 13 principles, unquote. Judah is also concerned with his family legacy as a scholar. He says, to whom will I hand my scholarship? To whom can I pour the nectar of my vines? Who will taste and eat of all my learning of my books when I am gone? That's a step. Oh, so awful. Sorry, it choked up here. And life was not easy for the Jews as they received a rather lukewarm reception by many of the surrounding kingdoms. In the case of Ferdinand, king of Naples, while his reception uh, was, re was hospitable, his people were less than pleased, especially since the epidemic began to spread amongst the Jews and then began to spread to the rest of the population. Now the word began to spread that wherever the Jews went, they brought plague with them and as they would, quote, kill them and their children, uh, says Elijah uh, Kapseli in his minor order to Elijah, uh, 71 to 20. Elijah still believed God was in control and felt that whoever would seek to harm the Jews would be punished, as did to the persecuting Don Juan of Portugal, who died in great agony and childless. Yet the Ottomans, so the Jews had nowhere to go. <clears throat> so who received these Jews uh, who were expelled, who were thrown out of, 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 of Spain, right? Thrown out, cast out. The Muslims did. The Ottomans received the Jews with favor. And Elijah believed God blessed them for this act of love. He declares, we thought that the exile was bad, but God saw it as good. And maybe, sorry, choked again. <laughs> sorry. indeed, it was just for this that we were banished and that the salvation began in the year 1492. 
for we all gather together excuse me, to be ready for the ultimate gathering of all the exiles. The reason why I'm choking up is these are Jews and Muslims working together in love. And then I think about what's going on right now in the Middle East. That's what chokes me up. So, you know, so it was possible at one time, right? Okay, Elijah held firm his conviction uh, that God has begun to gather together the scattered ones of his people so that they will be ready for the coming of the Messiah. He declared he cannot tarry much longer. And you're thinking, where does it? So, so at, at this point, we're gonna we're gonna wrap things up. I want to go go a few places more. Not that many. We're done. But I want to say, the Inquisition. Uh, what happens is Dominicans are in charge up to the 1500s, and then. Dominicans are in charge at times, but sometimes it depends on location. Sometimes it, the Jesuits are thrown into this. Obviously, never the Franciscans. So you have Inquisition courts, yes, in Spain and Portugal, but also goes into the New World. It goes into Africa. It goes to Asia. Did you know there's an Inquisition uh, in, in India, in Goa, of the Portuguese starting in 1560? It was a persecution of the Hindus. And during this persecution, this Inquisition, this is the Inquisition, same format, same everything else. They destroyed the Hindu temples. They burned any books in Sanskrit, but also in Dutch and English. Uh, they focused on the new converts to Christianity uh, to keep them from returning to Hinduism. The movement was uh, started in 1560. Uh, they, um, what happens is, is that non-Christians, they order, cannot hold public office. Hindus cannot produce any Christian devotional objects or symbols. Uh, Hindus, uh, cannot be, uh, witnesses and legal procedures at Goa. Uh, and they, what they do, though, is very interesting, is they put, they equate Hinduism with Malphicia. In our translations, we'll say witchcraft in English. So if you're a Hindu, you're practicing Malphicia. Uh, and so, and so therefore, all the wheels that we learned before, uh, right, uh, against witches, against the Malphicia, will now apply and move in uh, to uh, Goa and the surrounding areas where the Portuguese are having control uh, in India. In fact, having something written in Sanskrit or the local uh, Kankani uh, language was now a capital offense, was now a capital offense. And at the same time, you know, the, some Sephardic Jews then arrived in Goa. Guess what? The Portuguese then applied that, that inquisition against the Jews. Now the Jews are persecuted in India by the inquisition. How many people? Uh, were tried by the Inquisition in India, in Goa, 16,172 between 1560 to 1774, three-fourths of them were natives. Then it was suspended for a short period of time from 1774 to 1778. And from 1778, it continued on, continued on all the way to 1812. 1812. The, the Inquisition also went to Peru, the Peru Inquisition, right? 1570 to 1820, targeting Jews and Muslims and Lutherans. It went, there's there's the Mexican Inquisition from 1571 to 1820. The last one that was tried by the Inquisition outside of the Papal State, I said outside of the Papal State tried and executed. So the last person executed by the Inquisition outside of the Papal State happened in 1826. The last one killed, 1826. Uh, it's Gaeta Ripo. Uh, Gaeta Ripo, uh, he was the last one executed uh, in Spain because he was teaching deism. Uh, he was hanged. Uh, he was a schoolmaster. And uh, uh, he basically, as a schoolmaster, he didn't have reverence for the sacrament. He didn't see mass was necessary for salvation. 
And so the clergy requested that he would be burned alive at the stake. But the civil authority chose to hang him instead. The church authorities were so upset because he wasn't burned. He needs to be burned. He's a deist, for heaven's sakes, you know. So what they did is that when he was dead, they placed his body in a barrel and they painted flames on the barrel. They painted flames in the barrel and then they buried him on consecrated ground. So that way, technically, he was he was burned. So what happened? I said, so the Inquisition pretty much stopped in the 1820s, except for the papal state. What do you mean? This is my conclusion. So what happens is, is that it was abolished, except for the papal state. And the, the, the Inquisition now becomes part of the what's called the Roman Curia. By the way, hardly anybody knows this. The Roman Curia. The Inquisition kept going in the Roman Curia? Yes, yes, yes. And of course, um, following the precept earlier on, of course, of Pope Paul III, which will still be used for a long time. How long? We'll see. Uh, Pope Paul III says on July 21st, uh, 1542, he says that this institution is to defend Catholic faith from heresy spread sound Catholic doctrine and defend those points of Christian tradition which seem in danger because of new and unacceptable doctrines, unquote. This becomes the big motto. And so it becomes part of the Roman Curia, this Inquisition. Then it's renamed. It's renamed the Supreme Sacred Congregation of the Holy Office. What year? 1908. Wait, what? Then it's renamed again. And it's called the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith. When did they rename that? In 1965. And then they rename it again. The Asteri. The Asteri. That's D I. C-A-S-T-E-R-Y for the doctrine of faith. When is that name that? 2022. Ooh. The headquarters, of course, is the palace of the Holy Office. It still operates today, investigates crimes against the Eucharist. It investigates crimes against penance. It, gets, it, it, it persecutes, of course, of course, sorry, goes against crimes of adultery and other offenses to and heresies within the church. But with one interesting qualification, it doesn't go for those outside of the church. So just those within the church. And no longer is death or torture part of it. That's good news, right? No death or torture, just expulsion. You know, um, you know, in fact, it kind of sets back the clock back to the way it was uh, before we get to the time of the Cathars. So it sets back the clock so that, you know, you get in trouble. Um, also, they, they, they work with uh, civic authorities. One good thing they do is they're the ones that empower against priests uh, who, 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 who commit adultery specifically for those who are under 18 years of age. So so what they're doing is they switch things around. And so this is part of the arm uh, that's disciplining the priests for their various actions. That's a big controversy bit. But little did you know that it's part of this particular legacy. That's where it comes from. I just told you all the names all the way through. But, it is, but it, when it comes to the way it administers things, it sets back the clock before the time of the Cathars, where it's about people who are from within the church as opposed to forcing those from without the church, beyond the church. Or, and also, uh, if you are a lay person who's a heretic, it doesn't go, it's, it's focused more on those people who are clerics. So it's more focused. You guys got it? But still, there is that legacy. 
So we have just gone over. I know I like positive talks. I love positive talks. This is a very dark topic, but it does have to be known. It does have to be understood. It does have to be deciphered. It does have to be interpreted. It does need to be communicated. And so that's what I'm doing here. You had noticed that this entire talk, I would say about, I'd say about 70 to 80% of this talk were quotes from that time or from people from that time or, or excerpts from those histories just put together. So you literally heard from the inquisitors and you heard from those who were persecuted and you can understand what happened and the perceptions behind it. And so much is about, yes, the inquisition was absolutely 100% corrupt right from its inception. There's no way around it. It is corrupt. It also goes against so many ideas that were intrinsically part of even early Christianity. But I'll go further. It was also a political tool. That's what it is. It's the papacy's political tool in order to try to retain power in Europe over kings, right? Over lords, and princes, and nobility. This is their way of doing it. Creating fear that you are going to be charged as a heretic if you do not follow what we say and what we do, if you don't conform to our way of thinking. Because we want to keep you in the church because we want to stay in power. But also, it's about economics. It's about, hey, we can use the Inquisition to gather more revenue. You, They win. They get, you know, uh, you, you, what happens is if you're accused, you know, your property is taken away. In some cases, like obviously the church gets it. But in some cases, as we found out, the state gets it. But other people get it. So it is advantageous. It's also a social movement of power, of control, because the idea is, is that it stifles independent thinking. It stifles. Think of all these groups that want just to do their own thing. It's like, no, you have to believe what we believe. You can't think outside the box. You know, you, you, you can't have this dualistic system. You, 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 you can't have uh, the Bible and the vernacular. You know, uh, you can't, you know, uh, you know, on and on. You can't, uh, as women, you can't have power uh, through mystical uh, uh, gifts that uh, that seems to go against our authority. You know, we can't have, you know, and of course, obviously, we go into the Jews and others and everything. You know, it just, it's the, it is one of the saddest stories. And it is, I have to say, uh, one of the greatest and darkest black eyes on the church and its institutions. And says what happens when a religious institution has too much power the old saying absolute power corrupts absolutely absolutely it does absolutely apply to this and uh, we need we, there needs to be apologies obviously and there has been but we still need to have it coming and we still need to have this information more public in many ways so so is there something positive that comes out of this? Is there anything? Yes, there, there is. We survived, right? Yes, we survived. Not all of them survived. Uh, well, actually, the Templars, they survived. Uh, they ended up becoming, uh, uh, the, 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 you know, the connection to the Knights of John. They, they go to Portugal and their orders still exist. There are not very many of them left, but their Templars did survive. Pretty much a lot of them could be absorbed by the Hospitallers. You know, so I guess that didn't really survive, but uh, the Big Queens didn't survive. The spiritual uh, Franciscans did survive. The Waldensians by a hair, but they did survive. Uh, Protestant movement survived. Yeah, last I checked, right? You know, so, uh, and, and yes, the Jews survived. 
And um, so it is a story of survival that we got through these hard times uh, that is always darkest before the dawn. And that brings up one other point. And that is, is a lot of things are happening during the 16, 15, 1600s. And after the 30 year war, uh, the Holy Roman Empire, after that point, uh, people are exhausted, people are done. People are done fighting wars on behalf of religion. So already uh, the writings on the wall, even when it comes to church authority, uh, even as early as the 1600s. And of course, obviously that leads to these revolutions as we get into the 1700s and the 1800s. So uh, this, so so what we learn is that towards the end, these kind of powers hold on even more tightly, even more strongly than ever before because they know they are going to lose. They know their time is up. They know the winds of change are happening. And so they will fight, they will claw, and the Inquisition is that last gasp towards the end, and it's over. Darkest before the dawn. Thank you so much for being here. Whew.